detachment, they threaten to disrupt the fragile balance of life. Today, 20% of the population lacks access to safe drinking water. By 2025, almost 50% of the world's population will be struggling to find enough water to meet their basic needs. Although rainfall may increase, it won't be evenly distributed. There will be too much water in some regions during some seasons and too little in other regions most of the year. Demand management, water distribution and reuse will be key points. In order to ensure that every person now and in the future has access to clean drinking water and basic services, it is essential that the world's water resources are managed in a sustainable way. Contributing to the number of professionals and the amount of knowledge that is required to achieve this goal is what UNESCO IHE does. This is what it has been doing for 50 years. Since its birth in 1957, UNESCO IHE has educated over 13,000 water professionals. These are engineers, managers, policy makers and academics that are committed to the improvement of water resources and the empowerment of future water professionals. UNESCO IHE students are encouraged to develop a problem-solving attitude. They tackle water problems from a multidisciplinary approach and come up with solutions that are sustainable for their countries. Our students are an average age of about 32. So they're very different students than 18-year-olds who are attending university for the first time. In truth, in fact, we are interacting with colleagues. I'm really happy that I'm here with different people from different backgrounds because at times, before coming here, I used to think like what I think was the ultimate thing or the way how we people think back at home was the only way. But after coming here, I realized there are the, for the same thing, people might see it from different angle. So seeing it the way they see it is interesting. Every UNESCO IHE alumnus has stories to tell. Stories of overcoming difficulties, making sacrifices, developing new skills and working for a better future. Indeed, the story of UNESCO IHE is pretty much forged by the same energies. In 1953, catastrophic floods devastated large areas of the Netherlands. The collapse of numerous seawalls and dikes inundated 9% of farmland. 1,835 people died. 72,000 people had to be evacuated. This disaster triggered the erection of storm surge barriers across the rivers of the Rhine Delta. The project is one of the most extensive engineering projects in the world. Encouraged by the engineering knowledge which flourished during the Delta works, the Ambassador of Pakistan to the Netherlands, Her Excellency Mrs. Begum Ra'ana Liaquat Ali Khan, requested the Dutch government to share its experiences with other countries facing similar problems. It was the birth of IHE. We thought it was only temporary. We did, of course, perhaps it's Dutch custom to be very careful and to, to, to go slow, yes. And uh, so uh, in the beginning we made it only for one year. And when the one year was good, we tried to add the second year. And then the third year we tried to add the course in, in center engineering. And so we went on from year to year. IHE's beginnings were certainly successful. The first international course in hydraulic engineering in 1957 was attended by 44 participants from 21 different countries, well above expectation. The course, pioneered by the IHE, was the first in Europe to attract foreign mid-career professionals to upgrade their knowledge, and it attracted increasing attention in the next decade. The sudden growth wasn't exempt from difficulties, but a crew of enthusiastic lecturers, led by Professor Mostertmann, solved the problems in the most resourceful ways possible. We could get very famous people from big universities, for instance from Harvard, from the University of North Carolina and so on, who came to us easily, because in their own job they only were paid for 10 months. So for the 10 months they could come to me. 
By 1970, more than a thousand engineers from 90 countries had enrolled in the 11-month courses of the Institute. The courses diversified over the following years, covering a wide range of topics, varying from hydraulic engineering and dam construction to water resources, modelling of surface water, water pollution monitoring and control, and water supply and sanitation. But all the time, I was always thinking, or we were thinking, uh, will we discontinue this? Will we stop that and take somewhere else? So not going all the time, only at the same pace, but trying to renew. And I found it my own personal task to take care of that renewal. By 1977, the wide range of activities in which the Institute was involved was no longer sufficiently represented by the historical name International Courses in Hydraulic and Sanitary Engineering. So the Institute was renamed the International Institute for Hydraulic and Environmental Engineering, or IHE. The Institute, which had grown from a light sailing boat into a capacious cruise ship, demanded an ambitious captain. After Professor Mostadman's retirement in 1985, the Institute appointed an enthusiastic and experienced sailor who would guide the structuring and assembling of IHE. It was completely different from now, eh? it was completely mm -hmm. different. It only had about seven uh, diploma courses. It did not have masters of, uh, it did not have uh, PhD. It was only a question of diploma courses. But it could only help the people at, and uh, as long as they were working in the situation they started. It was not something that, that counted very much to their career as, as a degree. The programmes, the lab and the student accommodation all took shape between 1986 and 1996. Nevertheless, the cornerstone event of this decade was the development of the master programmes. In 1986, the Institute awarded the first two Master of Science diplomas and in 1994, the first PhD degree. Uh, at the moment that I accepted to become rector, I very really uh, realised myself that there had some... Uh, some thing to be done and one of the most important things to my opinion at that time was masters and then looking around the world I also saw that uh, very soon that PhD was also an accessory and so we started also PhD with a lot of difficulties but <laughs> we managed. The Institute's activities broadened to include capacity building projects in a number of countries. I think quite soon after that, after I came, uh, there were the first projects, but they were few, very few, I think, and certainly there were no, there were hardly any large capacity building programs. I think we went into projects in a much bigger way during the period that Segen was the director of the institute. Uh, I think he saw it as an opportunity to, to grow. If we do projects, then we'll have a volume of work, you know, and that means that we need staff. So I think it was part of a growth strategy. As the end of the millennium drew to a close, new challenges arose. IHE increased cooperation with institutions and actors in the water sector in order to reach further, while at the same time broadening the scope of its activities. These factors brought the pivotal question of internationalization of the Institute. 